the Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for CGE. Thank you for joining us for today's Expert Connect, the future of business education and work. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to do a few <coughs> housekeeping chores. Uh, we, will, uh, we will ask you if you're not speaking to keep yourself on mute. Uh, and uh, we also have a function you'll see on the bottom of your screen, a little icon that says Q&A. And if you have a question for our speaker, please uh, put your question in the Q&A uh, <coughs> um, icon down there. You'll be able to click on that. And uh, my colleague, uh, Toby McCarroll, will uh, select your question. And what we will do is elevate you to a panelist so you will be able to ask our speaker directly uh, the question that you have entered uh, online here. Uh, <clears throat> we are fortunate today uh, to have uh, Lori uh, Picard join us uh, <clears throat> for this uh, Expert Connect. I also want to mention that uh, this is part of a series that we put on as a uh, part of our Global Scholars uh, Program, which is a uh, global learning community of over 200 business schools or universities across the world and uh, in uh, 93 different countries. So we're happy to have Lori address uh, our audience and uh, talk about the topic today, which is the future of business education and work as the screen tells you right now. Uh, Lori has an interesting um, story, a progression for uh, what brought her here to this uh, uh, discussion. And uh, <clears throat> what you see here is a no pay MBA. Uh, back in 2013, Lori discovered the world of online education. Uh, she fell into it actually because she wanted to get an MBA to advance her career uh, and her job prospects. But when she looked into actually going to uh, obtain an MBA, the cost was prohibitive and the time commitment was also a turn off. But uh, fortunately for Lori and actually for us, uh, she happened to be talking about her dilemma with a friend who at that time happened to be taking a MOOC, a massively online uh, course, and uh, he was enjoying it. So he told Lori about that uh, online education and she started to investigate what it would take to get an MBA by looking up uh, all these courses that are available for free or at uh, minimal cost. Uh, and all this, as some of you know, is available from lots of schools and also including an organization like uh, CGE. She chronicled um, that experience, uh, which really entailed uh, getting the equivalent uh, of an MBA for uh, a fraction of the course. Uh, and she created a blog with um, hundreds of followers called No Pay MBA. And that blog really chronicled her experience, the experience of some of, of the people that she had discussed um, the programs with. Four years later, Lori has documented that experience and that of others uh, in the book, Don't Pay for Your MBA. I'm gonna hold it up here so everyone can see. Uh, <laughs> Don't pay for your MBA, the faster, cheaper, better way to get the business education you need. The book is uh, really a fascinating read and, and I recommend it. Uh, and, and not just because uh, this is a way to get around paying for an MBA. That's not what um, I think Lori is about or what the session is about. But the book combines uh, lessons that Lori learned firsthand and is documented in, in her blog, No Pay MBA, uh, with the personal anecdotes of people who have experienced this. So for people who are interested in pursuing a non-traditional MBA, I think you'll find a lot of value in this um, guide because there's a lot of uh, useful information and Lori takes you through it step by step. And I also, as a prelude to the book, hope you will enjoy this uh, webinar with Lori and please uh, follow up with any questions for our speaker. Lori, go ahead. Well, thank you for that introduction, Ira. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with you today and we're gonna cover a lot of ground. Um, as Ira said, we're gonna discuss business education and work and some of the important changes that are occurring that are affecting people, um, business professionals in all kinds of industries and how you can take advantage of some of those changes. Um, so I'll start by just giving a little bit more information about the No Pay MBA project, you know, what it is, how it got started, and uh, we'll take a look at who can benefit from self-directed business education. 
And then we will explore in some detail exactly what is involved in a traditional MBA and how you can repackage the MBA using free and low cost resources to, to create your own education program that exactly meets your needs and saves you a fortune. Um, so first, a little bit more about me. So I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, um, home of the arch. Um, I got a bachelor's degree at a small liberal arts college called Oberlin. Um, I was then a teacher in Philadelphia for two years and got my master's degree in geography from Temple University, um, all in Philadelphia. Um, then I joined the Peace Corps and embarked on an international career. So for those who don't know it, um, the Peace Corps is a US government program that promotes cross-cultural understanding and international development. And through that program, I was sent to Nicaragua. Um, from there, I got a job at the World Bank, also in Nicaragua. Um, then I moved to Rwanda and worked at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, so my career up to this point has been in it, both education and in the foreign aid ed, uh, industry. So that's kind of the perspective that I'm coming from. But you'll notice there's really not much of a business background there. Um, so while I was working at the World Bank, I started to feel that it would be very helpful to have more of an understanding about business, um, both that I would be competitive for future jobs in international development, but also that I would be more effective at the job that I was already doing, you know, working on, in poverty reduction programs, if I knew more about business. Um, but at that point, I already had a master's degree and I really didn't want to go back to school and I really, really didn't want to have any debt. Um, so that's kind of where my frame of mind at that point. Um, so as I already said, I found out about Massive Open Online Courses from a friend, which were still fairly new at that time. And almost as soon as I heard about these courses, I started wondering if anyone had already put together the equivalent of an MBA using them, because that was really my first thought when I heard that these courses existed. And I really thought that for sure somebody had already done that. So I Googled around and, and tried to find a person who had put together the MOOC MBA, didn't find it. And so in addition to creating my own MBA program, I thought, well, why don't I just blog about this experience so that I can have a way to hold myself accountable and also to share whatever it is that I learn about constructing my own MBA with whoever's interested in this um, as I was interested in at that time. Um, so my plan in kind of broad brushstrokes was to replicate the MBA course for course and internship for internship, experience for experience, um, taking three years of part-time study to complete the equivalent of a two-year full-time MBA program. Um, fortunately for me, so you know, I set up a blog, fortunately the project got some really good media coverage very early on. Um, oh, sorry, I kind of got lost in my slides. So Coursera uh, being one of the websites that I used, this being the website that I set up. Um, all right, so the project got some great media coverage very early on, this article, How to Get an MBA Education for Less Than $1,000, that uh, was first in Poets and Quants, and it uh, went to Fortune and CNN Money and went viral on LinkedIn. So it was kind of cool that the project got that much attention very early on. This was um, uh, one of the first article, it wasn't this article actually, but a previous one uh, that went viral on LinkedIn within four months of the project starting. So I started to get more people reaching out to me and I realized that there was a wider audience for this concept. Um, so that also kind of uh, began to shape how I did the education, knowing that there were people who were interested in this idea. Um, and then this other article um, appeared in the Financial Times. I was actually asked to contribute um, to a special article or a special section on online learning, um, which was very cool. Um, so ultimately, the project led to me writing this book, um, uh, and uh, the book really is a guide to how to use free resources that are out there, um, free and low-cost resources, to create your own equivalent to an MBA. And it is, it does, it, it is a complete guide, so it doesn't just include, I tried not to make just a checklist of take this course, then take this course, but it's more of a framework, and, um, and, and it, the book sort of acts as your personal MBA advisor so that you can tailor a, 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 an education that works for you given whatever your goals might be. Um, so through the book and through a small coaching business, I now serve as an advisor to in, independent business students around the world. Um, that's been a really fun thing to do. Um, so that's a bit about me and a bit about the No Pay MBA project. Um, I want to turn now to um, some of the drawbacks of traditional business education for um, 
both for me and for other people that I've talked to. Um, and this is some of what convinces me that we may be um, looking at some big changes in how education is delivered. So number one, which everyone knows, it's expensive. Um, second of all, it's, it's inaccessible to all but a few people. So if you, can, if you consider everyone who needs or could benefit from a business education, a traditional MBA program is really only available to a very few. Third, it comes really at the wrong time in your career, in my opinion. Um, so if, I, I put this picture here of young people because a lot of the education that you get um, in any kind of formal education program, it comes very early on in your career. And then you've got you know, 20, 30, maybe more years left in your career during which the world is changing. There are new skills that you probably need to adopt. Um, and you've got just this one kind of lump of education that you've gotten very early on. Um, so I think there's a need for more education throughout your career. Um, and then finally, it's a bundled product, meaning that everybody who goes to a particular MBA program gets roughly the same thing. They get the same progression of courses or something very similar. They're offered the same kind of internship opportunities, the same career services. They, they get kind of everything comes as a bundle and they've got to take all of it. They're paying for, for all of it. Um, but maybe they don't need all of it. They may not need the career services in the same way as someone else does. Maybe they don't need the same kind of travel or internship experiences. So um, I think there's an opportunity to take apart the MBA and put that bundle back together in a way that works for you. So really the, the solution that I found to this, um, to these problems, these drawbacks of traditional business education um, was to put together my own MBA. Um, and just to give kind of a, a another kind of, um, a little bit more explanation about why I think there's a, a need for people to continue to educate themselves throughout their careers. So these are just a few of the jobs that didn't exist when I graduated from college, and I'm really not that old. Um, the iPhone, Facebook, <laughs> Gmail, none of these things existed when I graduated from college. The cloud um, it maybe existed, but it not as with the name, the cloud. Um, and then some of the careers, blogger, app developer, social media manager, search engine optimization was not really a thing. So just to, to put in perspective that these are things that are so ubiquitous now and are so ingrained in how we work and how we, um, how we live, that these things just didn't even exist when I graduated from college. And that was after I got you know, this training that was supposed to be something that would carry me throughout a career. So just to really drive home the point that um, our educations don't, you know, can't serve us for that many years. Um, and then I really like this title of Unbundled, Reimagining Higher Education. This, of course, being an article by Anand Agarwal, who is uh, the CEO of edX, one of the big MOOC platforms, um, to, to make this point as well that education in a traditional institution is a bundled product, uh, but we can really reimagine how higher education works if we unbundle it. So I want you to imagine a business education that is affordable, that is accessible to anyone who wants it, that can be acquired on demand, and that is customized to the individual. So basically solving all those problems that I identified in a traditional business education. Um, okay, so I wanna turn now to talk about who are the kinds of people that might be able to best benefit from a self-directed business education. So through my work with independent business students, I've identified four types of self-directed business student, and I've seen people succeed coming from all of these four types, and it's kind of a different use case and a different value proposition for each of these people in looking at a self-directed business um, education. So first, um, the executive. So the executive is a person who is, has moved or plans to move from a technical working level role to a management role and who has a technical background but needs to be using more management skills um, and needs to be taking a wider view of the business or organization that they're part of. So this is a person who is in an organization where they are poised to move up or perhaps they already have and they're going to be a manager. This is not a person who really needs to go get an MBA in order to get their to move their career forward, but they do need the knowledge. So this is one person, uh, one type of person who can really benefit from a self-directed education. The second type is a type that I call the accelerator. So this is a person who is ready to take on new responsibility 
in a more technical role who by learning new technical skills can expand their repertoire, can um, move into some more interesting projects, can maybe switch functional roles within an organization and who really sees a lot of potential by adding to their skill set. Um, so that is the accelerator. Um, and I've seen people who fit this role um, who, who have been very successful in fields like marketing, data analysis, you know, people who are ready to take on, uh, um, especially with relationship to um, fields and skill sets that that maybe nobody has. A data analysis is a perfect example that it wasn't being taught in universities until very recently that somebody can really get into a role like that by um, educating themselves. Third type is the entrepreneur. Um, so we all know what an entrepreneur is, um, and this is a, a perfect use case for a self-directed business education. If you're putting together a business, you need the knowledge, you need the skills, but you've got to move fast and you don't need anyone to certify your skills. You're, you're directing your skills right into your own business. Um, I've also seen people, uh, so I've seen plenty of entrepreneurs use this education um, to serve their own business, their own business uh, goals. But I've also seen people who are what I would consider intrapreneurs, who are people who have um, a lot of great ideas that they would like to propose at their current place of work um, and who kind of need to take a business perspective in order to, to do that effectively. So I've seen that as well. And finally, um, the last type is the explorer. So this is another use case that I think a self-directed business education is really great for. Um, and this is the person who isn't really sure what they want to do um, post MBA and for whom a very costly education could be a very costly mistake, especially if they don't know what they're going to use it for. So it becomes very difficult to value that education um, and, and therefore to know whether the price makes it worth it given their particular goals. Um, so if you fit one of these types, or even if you don't, but you could benefit from a debt-free business education, there is a great opportunity for you to design your own MBA using the free and low-cost tools that are available. Um, oh, <laughs> so uh, sorry, I didn't know that one was going to animate right there. Um, so we talked about the MBA as a bundled product that comes with a set of courses and extracurricular experiences, travel, career services, etc. Um, so for the rest of our time together, what I'll do is share what I believe are the main elements of that bundle and um, how you can effectively put that MBA bundle back together at a fraction of the cost of an MBA degree. And so that's the premise of my book. Um, so what you'll get today is kind of an overview of what I then explore in great depth in the pages of the book. Um, so first thing that anybody studying business ought to know um, and that can really take you very far in your career is business language and concepts. Um, this is really kind of the foundation. So many MBA programs have sort of like a fundamental set of courses that everybody takes, or at least they have a list of courses from which all freshmen or, or first year business students draw from. Um, and, and so that kind of establishes this common foundation that, that anyone with a business education can communicate using the same language and the same concepts. And this I found was very powerful for me. So being able to use vocabulary, you know, terms like net present value or minimum viable product or things like that, that seemed like, you know, words that before I had a business education felt very impenetrable and, and people who use them, I felt intimidated at work. If I heard some of these words that I didn't know, um, having, taking just a few courses really felt like it just unlocked a whole new way of communicating with people that, that, gave me a lot of confidence. And I've seen that happen with other people too, that for a lot of people who feel intimidated or feel like they, maybe they don't belong in the world of business, learning business as a second language um, can really expand um, the way that you're able to communicate with people and can open up a whole new um, set of opportunities in, in, your, in your career. Um, so those, kinds of, those concepts are, are a great place to start where I think you get a ton of value from a business education. Of course, having the concepts is great, but having the skills is the other area that is extremely transformational. Um, and so what I did to, to write this book, so, so as I was creating the education for myself, I did kind of, I went course by course and tried to replicate what I saw in business, pro, uh, in MBA programs as being a, a course progression. But to write this book, I went back and, and re, I looked at everything again through the lens of skills. So not just what are you learning to talk about, what concepts are you familiar with, but what can you actually sit down and do? Um, and so 
as I wrote the book, I actually put together, and I'll show it to you where it is on the page, I put together this business skills framework so that as you're, I don't know if you can see this, I think you can. Um, so, and I put these skills into different categories. So financial and quantitative analysis, management and leadership, big picture thinking, communication and storytelling, and technology. Um, and the technology list is kind of a partial list. It's just sort of a demonstration. But so that as you're completing your courses and as you're thinking about, you know, what is a funda the fundamental business education that I want to have, this is my list of what I think are the business skills that everyone in business ought to have. And it includes things like reading and interpreting financial statements, organizing and managing a team, um, determining product market fit, giving a good presentation, and then the technologies, you know, it's things like email and shared calendars and video conferencing and project management and spreadsheets and things like that. Um, so I think that, again, as with the foundational language, that there's also a foundational kind of business toolkit that everyone in business should have a basic understanding of all of these different skills and be able to perform them at, at a pretty high level. Um, the third thing, and this was a little bit surprising to me, was how much energy is devoted in a traditional MBA program to career planning. Um, so MBA programs have you know, career services type offices, and they are really tracking students from the very beginning. And in order to make them successful, they're helping students get into internship programs, meet the, you know, just to know where they're going so that when they plan their, their coursework and their internships and their networking, that they know what they're heading towards and that they get some experience seeing what that career is like in the real world so that if they've made a mistake, they can um, kind of redirect. Um, so this is something that, that was, it, like I said, it was a little bit surprising to me that, that people came in, that so many people come into MBA programs without knowing where they're going. But again, this is, this is one of the things that for the explorer type, um, this is a real source of value, and it is a source of value that can very easily be had without going to an MBA. Like, you do not need to plunk down $100,000 to find out where you ought to be in the world of work. And in my view, a, a strategically spent $500 to $1,500 with some career coaching can really take you a long, long way. Um, uh, okay, so next piece of the MBA, and this is one that I get a lot of questions about, is networking. Um, so this is probably the, there are two questions that I always get when I say, oh, I, I did my own you know, replication of the MBA and people say, well, did you get the MBA degree? Well, the answer is no. And we'll explore that a little bit as well. But the, the second question out of people's mouths is, well, what about the MBA network? Um, and, and so this is another big source of value beyond what happens in the classroom in an MBA program. It is one of the tougher aspects to replicate. I, I, um, I recognize that. But it can be done. Um, and I think what you get when you put um, targeted effort towards networking is just as in your course progression, you can get a, a course progression that's tailored to your needs and interests. When you focus on your networking, you get a network that's more tailored to your particular interests. Um, so in the book, I offer some suggestions on uh, what are the actual techniques that you can use to network. Um, and I've seen people be very successful networking, especially when they've got a, a geographic location in which they're working, um, and then when they've got kind of a particular focus. So I've seen people who've gotten very involved, for example, in the startup community where they live, and startups in particular tend to be pretty open um, types of cultures where, where there are people who are kind of fostering a startup ecosystem, and I've seen people get very involved in that and be, have a high level of success with that. Um, I've also seen people use um, informational interviews to great effect. I've also seen people use um, tools like LinkedIn, um, Twitter, and social media um, in general to develop kind of a, a narrow area of expertise and to be able to have, um, to, to make great con connections in their area of expertise. Um, and so that's really cool to see people do that. Um, so that's networking. Um, and then next kind of element of the MBA bundle is experience. Um, this is one of the things that, when we when you talk about oh well do you have the degree uh is this really valuable if you don't have a degree well in my view this is by having by gaining experience that's how you can kind of circumvent the traditional credentialing system uh, because what does a credential really tell you well it tells you that somebody is prepared to do a job what and so it gives you some information about how prepared someone is to do that job if somebody has experience doing very similar work 
that gives you even more information. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the things I emphasize in the book is that if you are trying to move into a new role or you're trying to switch jobs and you need to take your, um, your education and make it work for you as you're getting a new job, the very best way to do that is to plow that ex the, the education that you've gotten directly into an experience that very closely replicates what it is that you want to have as your next job experience. And to do that even with no pay, even to do it um, for an organization that isn't your target organization, but to just build up that line on your resume that, that shows, uh, or that section on your resume that shows what you're able to do and that, that gets you some references who have seen it firsthand and that helps build your portfolio of work. And with that experience, then you can walk into your next job interview and be able to talk concretely about what you've done with your education, not just to say, oh, I hold this degree or this certificate or this whatever, from whatever institution that actually having the experience gives much more information and gives an employer much more confidence that you're able to do the job. Um, and then finally, and this is of course related to what we were just talking about is job searching. Um, so I do understand of course the anxiety that people have and there's almost a sense of kind of a security or it's like a safety blanket to have the traditional degree and, and many types of jobs do ask for it. But I think there's a huge potential for self-directed learners to showcase how unique and special they are. So you, if you're not kind of just the typical candidate who has the regular old degree and the regular old path, you've got a special path. Um, and you have some elements in your background that show that you're self-directed, that you're independent, that you don't need to be closely supervised, that you're curious, that you're a problem solver. You know, All of these things can make you, um, if you market them correctly, can make you a really a standout applicant. Um, and then the last thing, oh, I don't have a slide for it, but the last thing that I'll say about this is that um, pursuing a self-directed education relatively early on in your career prepares you to be able to add skills throughout your career and, and really boost your confidence. And I'll give you an example. Um, there's one person in my network who actually, um, I'm, I'm I love kind of following along with him in his career because it's just so inspiring. So he was um, a medical device engineer. That's how he started out his career. Um, he was very successful and very good at that job. He was asked to move into a management role um, and he actually pushed back and said, I want and, and was asked to get an MBA by going to school at night and the company was gonna pay for it. And he pushed back and said, you know, I have two young daughters. I don't really wanna be spending all my nights and weekends away from them. But I'd like to, um, he was follow, a follower of my blog, and he said he'd like to pursue the kind of education that I was proposing on my blog, which he did very successfully. Through that education, he got very interested in, in data science, and he then, um, he moved into this management role, was there and successful for a couple of years, and during that time, he was educating himself about data science. He proposed some additional kind of entrepreneurial projects within his work that were accepted and he was able to do those things and also became really interested in kind of the emerging field of people analytics and the uses of um, data analysis for HR purposes. Um, they created, the company created a new position for him. So he became the first ever people manager um, using data science to, to do some uh, advanced HR functions in his organization. And I, I caught up with him recently and, and he said to me, you know, one of the best things about having pursued my own education on my own is that I feel really confident to be able to go out and acquire new skills. So if there's whatever the next thing is, you know, right now it's data science, but it's going to be something else. And I'll feel ready because I have this ability and I know it's, dem it's a demonstrated ability. I have a demonstrated ability to pick up new skills. So I'll feel really confident, whatever that next thing is, to go out and seek, uh, seek out the training that I need and use that um, in my job as it's necessary. Um, so in conclusion, I, I guess I would say that I don't really think it's up for debate whether the MBA education is available to anyone. It absolutely is. It's out there. That education is freely accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Um, one of the things that was really surprising to me as I went through this is that I could have easily done 10 complete business education programs with all the content that is out there and never have, have repeated a single course. Um, so this is a tremendous opportunity that we have. Um, so what I, what I want you to ask yourself, I'd leave, I, I'd leave you with a few questions. So number one, could I, or my employees, if you're a person who employs people, um, could I benefit from additional business education? Um, number two, am I capable of learning on my own? 
Number three, do I believe in and support self-directed learning? Um, and finally, am I willing to put a little bit of extra effort and creativity to reap the full benefits of a self-directed education? Um, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, then you are poised to take advantage of the exciting changes in business education and work. And uh, final slide, so to leave, learn more or get in touch, uh, my website is um, nopanba.com and there's a contact form on my website that goes directly to my inbox and I answer all my mail. Um, if you'd like to read the first chapter of my book, it's available with that link. And then um, down at the bottom, a link to the book on Amazon. Excellent. Thank you, Laurie. Um, and I want to remind you, if uh, anyone has a question for Laurie, please post it in the Q&A section and we will uh, get around to those questions. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to take the privilege and ask a few questions of Laurie. First of all, I think people are going to want to know, how much money did you actually wind up spending for uh, your MBA or the equivalent of an MBA? And um, I also, as a follow-on question, I'm curious, uh, you know, that was a powerful story you told about the self-learner and the changes in the career, but I'm curious, how do you convince uh, the HR person or the interviewer that you've assembled this degree and it is indeed worthwhile? You know, what, what, are the, what are the talking points um, that you recommend? I know you had referenced experience as uh, a guide here, but I think it would be useful to have people hear a little bit more detail about how you would approach um, perhaps an interview. Sure. Um, so for your first question, how much did I actually spend? Um, so I, I did an accounting of this at one point. Um, so I, I didn't really you know, pinch pennies throughout this. I, I was willing to spend money on courses as I felt that I needed them. But at first, MOOCs were completely free. You could get certificates even without paying for them. Um, so I estimated that at the end of everything, um, through for just courses and books and things of that nature, you know, just the content, I spent about $800 over three years. Um, and then I spent probably, I think $1,500 is what I came up with for those first three years of how much I spent on my website. Um, and then of course, when I converted um, this project into more of a business, um, I started spending more money on the business side of it, um, which was kind of a cool experience too, because it was, it was almost like it was the kind of the practical project that I did at the end of the education was to start a business. And so I learned a lot from that as well. Um, and uh, in the process, you know, got my website turned into a, a, a money-making venture. Um, and uh, so I spent much more on that, but then a lot of that money has come back. So it's hard for me to answer the question with a single number, but those are kind of my, my best estimates, $800 for courses and then another 1500 to 2000 on just running a website during that time. Um, but yeah, a fraction of the cost of a, of a traditional MBA. Um, and then to your second question about how, you know, how do you actually convince someone that this is an education that, that's worth something? Um, I think, you know, the first thing is, um, part of it just depends on your audience. So there are some industries and some jobs for which you will never be considered if you don't have a, a master's degree and in particular an MBA degree or a finance degree or something like that. And so there are some people who just need that. However, I don't think that's most of us. Um, I think most of us, most careers, most career pathways do not require an MBA, even in business. Um, and, I, and I really think that having strong experience and strong references is um, how, you, how you make that case. Um, so my hope, I guess, would be that you're not typically making that case um, to a skeptical HR person, but that rather your pathway to rise, if this is your if this is the way that you're going is probably more through your personal connections and through people who know you, who know your work, who are intrigued by this concept at the outset so that you're getting a more receptive audience. Um, you know, like the story that I told where this, these were internal moves, but I've seen people do this with external moves as well um, by working through their networks and, and having some kind of professional contact that demonstrates how skilled they are as professionals and, and inspires um, respect. Um, so, so that then that enables a move. Good. Look, I want to ask another question, and then we'll start going to some of the uh, questions in the Q and A. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, you know, in, in talking about online education and MOOCs, we kind of think of the traditional education. You're taking a course on marketing. You're taking one on finance. But I'm wondering, and um, uh, and and under full disclosure, Lori does write a little bit about CGE and, and Global Scholars Program. But I'm wondering um, if you can tell us a little bit about the uh, unusual 
uh, experiences that you found out there that really can uh, broaden someone's uh, skill level? Well, um, so I, I, I kind of pursued this as with each course, I was always seeking, well, what's the way that I can do this thing so that it moves out of the classroom space or out of just, you know, my laptop screen and moves into the real world that I get a chance to actually use these skills in a, in a situation that is not um, just a, you know, a question on a test or, or a, a classroom exercise, but is a real world problem solving activity. Um, so some of the things that I did, um, and I would imagine, you know, just as each course progression is going to be different, each set of interests is going to be different, each person will find different kinds of experiences that can help them build those skills. So for me, one thing I did, um, I studied finance fairly early on um, in my MBA, and uh, there was, I was working in Rwanda at the time, and there was an employee, a small employee association um, where I was working that had a small treasury that needed, a, they needed a board, they were having board elections, they needed a finance person. And so I said, okay, you know, this is kind of a low stakes environment, I'll, I'll sign up for this. And I ended up, um, I took what I learned in finance class and went so much farther with it because what I, they needed a full overhaul of their books. So I ended up becoming basically their accountant for, um, for a little while. And it was a really small organization so that made it easy, it was approachable, their books were in shambles, so it wasn't as though the person before me had done a great job. Um, so the stakes seemed low, but you know, that was a really unique experience. Non-replicable, of course, but I'm sure many people are part of organizations and networks that have a need for this kind of, um, for this kind of thing. So, you know, you can find ways to put those skills into practice. Um, other things I did, um, I was part of a digital internship. So um, there was a company, I don't think they're operating anymore, unfortunately, because I loved this company, um, but they were a startup that, that didn't end up having a big enough market for their product, but they ran digital internships. It was called Corsol. Um, and I did an internship um, doing a strategic analysis as, as an intern. And it took directly from what I was learning in my strategic analysis class. And I was able to do that analysis um, through the internship. The Alpha course is one through the CGE that I'm a big fan of. Um, I have not done one myself, but when I've heard about how this is, how the what what it looks like, what the Alpha what the Alpha team looks like, um, when I've talked to people who have participated, it's an incredible. I mean, it's you're getting basically what you get in a business school environment, and it's free, um, which is amazing. Um, I've also seen people do you know through volunteer experiences through nonprofit organizations that they are connected to or with startups or small businesses or family businesses where they say you know hey i think we could i think we could do better on for example our operations management if they're part of a family business or a small business you know could i just take on this little project to um you know improve how we do whatever this process is that we do day in and day out um, and i've seen people do that as well so those are some of the examples of ways to, to put the education into practice Great, thank you. Um, and just to clarify or to uh, add uh, a little explainer, Lori mentioned the Alpha uh, Alpha teams that CGE puts on, and those are uh, company-sponsored uh, six-week intensive programs where you work with a team of 20 other individuals, 21 other individuals from around the world to solve a problem for a company. And as Lori mentioned, it's really a wonderful in-depth, um, jumping right into it, real real-world experience. Now, uh, let's have Toby call up uh, a questioner to uh, present. Sure. So um, our first question actually comes from an anonymous viewer who we're not able to uh, promote to a panelist, but I'll, I'll ask the question on their behalf. Um, the question is, Laurie, does someone who has an undergraduate degree in another field, such as humanities or social sciences, um, but are interested in business, business, can they now be considered uh, under explorer in your book? Um, yes, absolutely. So um, that category of explorer, I think, really applies to anybody who is interested in a business education, but is not entirely sure about what they're going to do next. Um, so somebody who has a background in humanities or social sciences and who is thinking, you know, oh, you know, I, I, I have this sense that maybe I need a business education, but I'm not totally sure what I'm going to do with it. Yes, I would consider you an explorer. And I would say that as you kind of dive into the business curriculum, you may be very surprised by what appeals to you what doesn't appeal to you, and what kinds of opportunities you see come up. Great, thank you. Um, Bo had a question about translations. I'm gonna let, uh, let them ask. Hi, Bo, can you hear us? Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 
Uh, I'm from China. I'm just wondering, will the book be translated, translated in other languages like Chinese in the future? Um, I really hope so. So my publisher is working on that right now. Um, I can tell you that there's an interest in Chinese and in a couple of other languages as well, which I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Um, but I'm very hopeful that the book will be translated into other languages, in particular Chinese. Well, thank you very much. Very much. I'm really looking forward to it. Good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Techno. Techno, you on the air? Yeah. You can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, I, hey. Hello. Uh, I was, yeah, yeah. So I was asking, you know, this, these MBAs are like, they are tailored according with the example and all of that according to the environment. So I was asking how relevant is that book to an African MBA, like relevant to an MBA that's provided in African environment, how that book is relevant? Um, well, so to answer your question, so I, I think it's highly relevant to an African setting for a few reasons. So number one, um, the cost of a European or American MBA um, is extremely expensive, especially if you're coming from, from Africa. Um, and the quality of the education that you can get through these courses is extremely high. So you can really maximize the education that you're getting. Um, I did this entire education from Africa, actually. I was living in Rwanda and, and I, I was able to do all of my courses and all of this from Africa. And one of the things that was really cool for me was I got very interested in entrepreneurship and in particular, um, base of the pyramid entrepreneurship. And so, um, it was really fun for me to be able to directly see concepts that I was learning about um, social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship for development just in my local community. Um, I don't know if we can get techno back. I, I'd like to know where in Africa you are located um, and, and what your goals are. Because the other thing I've seen in Africa um, or in, in the African context that I'm familiar with was um, credentialism. So, so where people kind of put too much emphasis on the credential. So in that, um, in that respect, it may be less relevant to an African context if you're just trying to get a job at a regular old company and they really want to just see that piece of paper. Um, I think that's one kind of, that's one drawback and I've seen people be even more attached to the credential in, in certain contexts that I've worked in. Um, but if you're going in the entrepreneurship path or if you're um, working in a family business, I, I think it's highly, highly relevant. Um, so uh, so that, that's kind of my, my two cents on that. And actually, Laurie, yeah, after yeah. this uh, question, I'm sorry to interrupt, you're going to have another one about credentials, so you can okay. go into okay. that after this. Yeah, well, I, Akeem actually, his question follows right up on that. Great. Yeah. Akeem, you're on the air, go ahead. Okay, um, hi, my name is Amataya Akeem from Nigeria. Hi. Okay. Um, actually, you've answered 50% of my question. Um, I'm, because of, I, I am also into, I, I also do a lot of um, YouTube videos, webinars to, to be able to um, up my skills and all of that, even MBA using through data university and all of that, but it is very difficult to get things like job and all of that here in Nigeria, for example. So now my question is that, how do we manage how do we manage after gaining all of these skills and we are already good to go, but we can't get job because of everybody needs certification. They want a recognized certification and all of that. So how do we go about it? Well, I have some tips for you. Um, I do think this is a real problem and, and it can be difficult. Um, but I, my, my advice to you would be to seek out kind of shorter programs that come with a certificate. So maybe not the full scale degree, but perhaps, um, you know, boot camp style education or online training programs that include a certificate that then can, becomes kind of part of your evidence. Uh, I would caution you not to have, you know, like 20 certificates, but really to focus on like one or two that are very impressive and to add to that a portfolio of work so that then when you are going for that position that you can 
point to the specific training that's very impressive that you're certified for and then and then it goes with like it's kind of matched to some work that you've done that you can also show and then you can talk about that work in your cover letter and you can have it as part of the experience on your cv so that rather than just having oh, this is something i've seen when i've done hiring um is I've seen people who've got like, you know, 20 certificates and I don't know how to go through it. Like I've seen like, oh, you were in a workshop on this and you were on a workshop on that and you did a course and they all just kind of look like short little courses to me that don't seem very impressive. And maybe I skip over that resume because I can't tell what I'm looking at. On the other hand, if you've got a very targeted CV that says, okay, you know, I learned this skill and this skill through these courses and I put those skills into practice and you can see evidence of the work that I did. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it in my cover letter and that matches to the job that I'm hiring for, then I, I, I think you have a much greater chance of making it for, through that first screen. Thank you, Lori. Um, our next question comes from Nagabu. Um, I don't know if you can hear us, but you're on the air. I'm not sure if they're able to speak, but are we? Frozen. <laughs> I, I, I'll go ahead and read the question for you, and it's about soft skills um, and electrical power. He's an electrical power professional. Um, I, I guess if there are any programs uh, that can make him more exceptional or smarter in this field that you know of. Sure. Um, well, so this is what I would call the the uh, executive um, ca uh, use case, where we're talking about somebody who has uh, strong technical skills and who's looking to move into more of a management role. And that does come primarily through soft skills, um, through the ability to manage people, to um, give good presentations, to take a global view of the business, you know, things of that nature. It's kind of like going from the working level, like going to a higher level of, of, of thinking about the whole organization. And I do think that's something that is very, very possible with the courses that are out there. Great. And another question we have from uh, one of our anonymous viewers is with so many, um, you know, my, my uh, courses online uh, behind paywalls, how can we get the same value from auditing them uh, going through the course without access to certain parts or no certificates? Or is it only worth it uh, by, I guess, paying to get the full course? Yeah, this is a great question. And, and this is obviously somebody who is familiar with MOOCs and how they work. Um, MOOCs used to be totally free and open and it was so wonderful to be able to get these full courses. They were fully featured. They, um, they were really exciting. And then gradually they've kind of gone behind paywalls where like first it was just a certificate that was behind the paywall. And now in, in many cases, it's even, you know, some of the assessments and the projects and things like that. So that what you're getting for, the, for free or to, when you audit a course is much less exciting. Um, and that's a real disappointment to those of us who were part of, uh, who were taking MOOCs when they were new. Um, so I don't think it is the case that you have to pay for every single MOOC that you take. I think you can get a lot of value from what's being offered for free. And then my advice would be to choose a couple of certificates in your kind of deep area of skills, your, your, your skills concentration, which is another thing I didn't touch on it in this talk, but I touched on it in, in depth in the book of like, how do you build a skills concentration? Um, so then when you get your certificates, get like two or three in your area of concentration and for advanced coursework, not for the intro level coursework. But I think you can find most things, you know, even if you have to be a little bit creative about it, you know, you watch the finance lecture and then you find the finance project somewhere else, or you, you know, watch the marketing lecture and then you kind of do some additional work to, to do the equivalent of an assessment or of a project on your own. Um, I think it's worth it. And, and because if you're, and if you end up paying for certificates for every single course, you're talking about, um, you're getting up to um, several thousand dollars and that, that uh, may not be worth it. Great. Thank you, Lori. And our next question comes from John. Uh, John has a bit of background noise, so I'm going to read the question for him. Um, and he says, considering the craze in which employers have for experience in a, pers in a person's resume, would it be wrong to, uh, a wrong move to seek experience in a field that you did not study for? Um, I think it's a great move to seek experience for any position that you're applying for, especially if it's not in the field that, that you were trained in. Uh, I mean, I think that is what's required, actually, if you're going to try to switch fields. Um, one, of the th one of the pieces of advice that I sometimes give to people if, if I'm asked about, um, you know, should I, do I need to get an MBA? Um, one of the things I say is if you're going for the triple move, if you're trying to switch company, role, and industry, you may well need another degree in order to be able to do that. But if you're only switching two of those variables, oh, and a fourth variable would be country or location. So if you're changing all four of those, it, it may be a good idea to have a degree. But if you're only switching two or three, 
you can maybe make that move um, without getting another degree. So, uh, and I think it's a great idea to try to seek experience in order to facilitate that kind of transition. Thank you, Lori. Our next question comes from Steinberg Rua, and um, you're on the air. Uh, hi. Hi. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Oh, great. Uh, but I'm glad there was something, she, I, I'm actually from Kenya. Oh. Yeah, and um, there's one thing I really <coughs> agree with uh, her. She said that uh, in Africa, the problem is we place so much value on, uh, you know, the certificate more than the skills. That's, and in fact, like me as a person, I've, I, would, I would say I've really benefited a lot from, uh, you know, the online courses. There's a lot that I've learned that I didn't expect I was going to learn. That's the first thing. Then, you know, the nature of our, our environment, not everyone is able to afford to go to, mm -hmm. to, you know, college and get quality education. Because even the ones who go, you find like the local universities around, they don't offer that, you know, no knowledge that you'd say you could actually be. I, I have so many, but I even have like a friend of mine I was discussing with yesterday, like she has a cousin who has even a, she has a master's, but she still can't get a job. So the problem is, our, uh, you know, our system of education around here is so centered around papers and it's not as uh, cutting edge as you, when, okay, when you compare it to the, the ones offered by MOOC. But now the challenge is something that I wanted to ask about the relevance of uh, like the MBA, you're telling us about the MBA. How relevant is the MBA, in, especially in this digital, uh, the way we are shifting towards a digital economy? How relevant is it? Well, um, so, so yes, yeah, so I, I, I really understand what you're talking about in terms of um, the over, my, in my opinion, over-reliance on credentials. Um, and I, I'll tell you, you know, when I've done hiring um, in, when, when I was working in Africa, and I would see these resumes that were literally, they were literally CVs that were six pages long, just filled with trainings, and sometimes they were really hard to read. And, and, I, and I sort of felt like, the, the person whose resume I was reading was like trying to give me just everything, you know, everything I've ever done so that you can see that I'm a qualified professional. And in a way, it almost made it harder as somebody who was hiring to see, you know, so much. Um, so, and, and I've also seen, you know, I've been so impressed with some of the entrepreneurs that, that I met while I was working in Rwanda who kind of found they were looking at some kind of business problem and come, came up with just the perfect solution um, for that local context and, and I was so impressed with, you know, some of those types of solutions. So I guess what I would say to you is that um, I think that there may be, it may be worth taking a risk um, to try to package your, your CV in a different way that um, if you employ some creativity, if you um, really try to think from the perspective of whoever is going to be reading your resume, what do they need? And so that's kind of, I guess that's why I'm drawing in um, something from entrepreneurship, just to think about, you know, not just like, what is a resume supposed to look like? What is the path that I'm supposed to be going down? Because that's kind of what I've seen on, on many resumes that I've evaluated, but rather to think from a different perspective, which is what successful entrepreneurs do. And to say, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? Who is the audience for this? What is the solution that's going to work for them? And to create your resume that way. Um, and, and I think that there's a potential there. I'm not going to say that I'm positive that that will work for you, but I think there, that may be a way to, to approach this that could potentially get around some of this problem of, of just not having exactly the right credential and, and feeling like your resume gets passed over. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Lori. I, I believe Akeem wanted to ask another question. You are on the air. I don't know if you can hear us. All right. Um, well, since then, we've actually received a question again from one of our anonymous viewers um, saying, I am currently practicing a practicing engineer but with a flair and interest in marketing and business strategy. I have taken some online courses um, and he lists a couple of examples. How can I convert these skills to be able to use to, uh, to use them to get a desired job um, in these areas of marketing business strategy. Um, and I, the follow up to that is everything is going online nowadays. When do you think that uh, these co online courses will be valued, appreciated, like those offered by traditional educational institutions? 
Um, good questions. Okay, so the first question I would say, if you're practicing in a field, um, your first best place to look is where you're already working, where people know you, where you have a reputation, where you have a very good sense of what is needed um, to try to get onto some kind of group or committee or just even chat with the marketing person or marketing people um, and start to get into those conversations if there's an opportunity there. If there's not an opportunity there, I would say um, some volunteering in um, for a nonprofit type organization that's related to what your skill um, area is, where you can be a valuable contributor and then kind of expand your skill set into some of these things that you're really interested in. Um, th those would be my, my two kind of main tips. And I guess a third one would be uh, working on your own business or on your own um, kind of venture especially if there is scope within your organization for some kind of intrapreneurship. Um, some of the you know, marketing and strategy are things that are really needed, not just when you're dealing with an external audience, but also when you're dealing with an internal audience. And there can be a lot more potential and opportunity if you're in a, in a company to propose a new idea and then kind of have to market, you know, you're kind of, you're like an entrepreneur in the sense that you're solely responsible um, for that, you know, kind of nurturing that idea and helping it to grow. And you need a full um, 360 degree business type education and view of that idea to help foster it and, and, and know what it needs to, to get legs. Um, so that's, that's, that's um, to your first question. Um, to the second question, uh, when do I think that um, online courses will be valued and appreciated in the same way that traditional um, degrees are? You know, I, I don't, I, uh, if I had to kind of gaze into my crystal ball and say what I think is going to happen, um, I think people will still be paying attention to, to degrees for, for a while to come. But I think what's going to happen is that um, degrees will be seen more as kind of um, one option among other options um, that people will, especially for targeted skill sets that shorter credentials may become really important. Um, you know, things like MOOC certificates, uh, micro masters, specializations, nano degrees, you know, all of these kind of burgeoning micro credentials that are out there. Um, I think that those are going to become systematized and that employers are going to take more recognition of those. And I also can imagine um, employers beginning to even create their own pathways, um, educational pathways that, that prepare people really well for roles in, in technical fields, especially in fields where employers find that graduates of um, regular programs are not just aren't ready to do the kind of jobs, you know, right out of the degree program. Um, so, so I do think we're going to continue to see changes, and, and I think what we're going to see, rather than um, fewer kinds of programs, I think we're just going to see more um, for the foreseeable future, and that maybe that a kind of a, a culling down is not going to happen for quite some time. Thank you, Lori. I notice we have three minutes left. Ira, I don't know if you had any fi final question you wanted to ask. Uh, no, but I think there's one more question that I don't think we had a chance to get to. And there was a request for examples, Laurie, of sites <clears throat> where you can get free um, online MBA or courses uh, <clears throat> that are, you know, because as you mentioned, uh, I think a lot of companies have caught on and put courses behind firewalls. So yep. uh, can you cite any examples of, of uh, free courses that you would recommend? Sure. Well, so I think almost everything on edX is still free. At least there's an option to audit. Um, on Coursera, there are still some programs that are that are you can audit or you can audit some portions of the course. Um, I'm also a big fan, and these are not free, but I'm I'm a fan of courses on Udemy, especially if especially if you're trying to um, put skills, you know, find ways to use your skills. I find that those courses are very skill focused. So one thing I would probably do if I were doing this um, today would be to take the academic course, you know, audit it do whatever portions of it they've made free, and then go on to Udemy and find their course, you know, find the, the professional in the field who's teaching from their professional expertise and do the $10 course on Udemy to be able to then like, you know, put the skills into practice. Um, so that, that's one strategy that I would use, not totally free, but, but much more affordable than, you know, 40, 50, 60 or more dollars for a certificate. Um, and then my other piece of advice is um, to go on to Class Central. I don't know if you're, if you're the question answer or asker is familiar with Class Central. Um, but full disclosure, I'm working for Class Central because I think they're such a great company and there's um, a lot of overlap with, with what I do. Um, but Class Central is a search engine for MOOCs and they've got um, a com pretty complete listing of courses. So you can search across platforms and you can see, you know, what, what is the free option? What's the option for the certificate? Is there a credential involved? It allows you to really compare across courses and across platforms in your subject area. 
Wow, that's a great idea for a service. Uh, yeah. let's, try, let's try and get one last question in. I have it. And uh, here we go. If you guys don't mind, uh, we have uh, uh, Ozuwala. You're on the air. Can you hear us? Um, I think there's some background noise, but I'll ask the question yeah. on their behalf. And it basically, the question says, can you advise me on how to reduce distractions and focus uh, to complete courses? Because I have, there are so many I have not completed. And I, I'm assuming this is probably a frequent question to get from oh people my gosh. who are doing it, online courses. Yes, it is a frequent challenge. It's really hard. This is one of the hardest things is maintaining your motivation. So I've got some tips for you on this. Um, Actually, I wrote an article on Class Central um, a couple of years ago with a, it's a list of 25 different ways to try to maintain your, your focus and motivation. But I would say number one is have a goal. Um, that's really important. Number two, I would say make yourself accountable to somebody besides yourself. So like tell a spouse, a friend, a, a partner, a, um, a course buddy, a, an employer, you know, a parent, anybody that you intend to finish a course and, and ask them to, to help hold you accountable. Um, I would say to become part of a community so that if you've got you know, other people in the course who you're working alongside, a course buddy or people that you know outside of the course or people who you meet through the course, you know, continue to do the course with them. Um, I would say use your calendar so that you block off the time when you are trying to study. Um, and then I would also say like close all your other windows on your computer. Like don't allow yourself to be checking email or multitasking. I've even done, where I've sat away from my computer, where I like move my chair two feet back from my computer and sit with a piece of paper so that I can't click on anything else. I'm just watching that course. Um, and I found that to be effective as well. But I agree with you, it's hard. Um, it's hard in a regular class lecture too. I don't know if um, the person asking the question has been in a college lecture hall recently, but like you see people with their laptop out, their phone out, people are distracted everywhere they go. So this is not just a problem in the online classroom, it's a problem everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> great. great thank you Lori. uh thank you this has been wonderful uh great questions uh great presentation i want to remind people that the book is i'm gonna hold it up again uh here you go here's and my copy too <laughs> <laughs> you can uh actually you can see better on Lori's uh, screen uh and, and i'll also um, let the audience know that I, there's a companion guide to the book which is available on my website so i actually printed off a copy and got it spiral bound but this is available for download when you buy the book and it just it's it pulls from the book but it's basically just all the checklists that are in the book of how to go through this education on your own Oh, that's great. Very helpful. And I want to remind people, too, that Lori's website is nopaymba, that's all one word, dot com. And the CGE website, where you can also find other uh, alternatives uh, for online education, is the, T-H-E, C-G-E, dot net. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their time, especially Lori, uh, for a great presentation and discussion. And Toby, thank you for engineering all the questions. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.